in this uh, uh, presentation, what I'm trying to do, uh, trying to give you some surface issues. When we talk something, what actually it implies deeper. So the attempt would be from my side to talk some surface issues, which really we accept every day in Kahneman's terminology system one, and go down then to the deeper thinking that what is the philosophical undercurrent of that. So the, what, what we try to do, we talk the surface issues and we go down and also look at the philosophy behind that. So these two things we do. Uh, I have written some provocations in the paper which I shared with you. This is not a theory in fact. It is not a theory, it is a provocation for the social scientist. Uh, because why I, I went through this trouble? As economist, when I see the economic growth everywhere taking place, but the society instead of actually moving forward gets into trouble. And there is what will be the better example than the Middle East, where you had economic growth so rapidly because of the oil and other kind of thing, but the society collapsed and what consequences we have, we all know. Where the technology moved faster, over the society and the social change. The disaster is only expecting to come, we expect only the disaster to come maybe in near future. And that what we did. And that is where I am telling that the undercurrent of economic growth can be of different kind and the underlying impact can be long term in a more actually what already uh, Beck called the risk society we may be creating, I will come to that. So this, this, what actually is a very personal experience, what I say, took the theory and trying to do some provocations rather than counter, but put the some kind of provocation uh, for the economist and for the geographer who look for the economic growth everywhere. And the only occupation for the social scientist now is coming to be only with economic growth. For what? For whom? Where? How? Why? With what consequences? Uh, all these are the questions which actually like younger generation like you need really need to do that. When somebody tells you we need to achieve 10% growth of China, you must be also careful that what kind of consequences we generate uh, uh, with the long growth, with this faster growth. So what would be uh, my, uh, the sharing of this would be based on two, three assumption. One is the theoretical basis from which actually what I say background from which I drive those argument. Second is the personal experience because in transitional society what I have personally gone through and why I am reflecting so much on that. Maybe wrong reflections altogether. I could not, uh, I, I am sure that some of you uh, who are going to do uh, look uh, another they are going to discuss all these, Mariana and other, they're going to discuss all these things and really provide a good comment and criticism on that. And I'm sure I will also engage with you after that in the discussion. And third thing is some kind of data mobilization with empirical realities. Uh, so realities, how you see, how you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the way you want to see with the kind of glasses you wear and see the world, that makes your reality. And that is where perhaps we need to really widen ourselves, look at the various reality from those perspective. So the attempt would be here, not look side the, this side of the photograph, but look from the other side of the photograph as well, because often we look only one side. And this creates the wonderful, uh, I mean, you say that illusions in which we live and actually practice, and particularly the economic policies and other, uh, that is what my attempt. Uh, I brought here the cities, but because cities have been very important, all of you know, they have been considered the machine, growth machines. Uh, that is one question that we all talk about how the growth happens. But where growth happens, that is not the question which actually has been solved by the economist. Everybody talks that growth happens in India. But India, where the growth happens? I know that why the growth happens, but where the growth happens, that is actually, and that these are the cities. These are the cities which actually in the capitalist societies have become the prime nodal uh, uh, centers from where the growth really emerges and it actually goes like waves everywhere and actually spreads. That is what actually we have found in the last, particularly the 20th century and after that. 
and that is why I say that what the paper I shared, I say that 75 percent of India's GDP emerges from the growth of the cities. And that means, and these have only 31 percent of the population about. And then you have about 70 percent of the population which is somewhere else. And that becomes a kind of force to migrate to the city for the employment, for the health, for the education, and then you have the cities in problem. And because the way we emphasize the growth, and that becomes very important. Then the question comes, is there a possibility to slow down? To see that reflect, can we have a reflexive modernization process? Reflexive economic growth. Reflexive means that Giddens term sociologist what he, from London School of Economics, what he talks about that can we really see, see for the other side of the things what is happening. We can absorb the things but actually also reflect back that the, what are the consequences of the same. So the kind of reflexive uh, economic growth and economy uh, can we have as individuals and that is very much needed for all of us to evolve as a good global citizens. And in that paradigm I locate this presentation and I again say my job is to provoke you. Provoke you, provoke you that you start countering me. Start countering me and then you go back your home or your flat, your rented apartment and you say that something was there. And that is actually the, the success lies in that for a teacher. And I, I look forward for that and that, that happens. When I talk the two, three clarity more I want to say before I start on that, I use the term north and south. North and south which actually used uh, I mean development economists have used for a long time north and south. I use the terminology here in the two sense. Perhaps the use from the north is a European and uh, uh, American anglo sanction world uh, that actually this uh, US and UK and European continental because they are developed north. Uh, and the rest of the world basically what becomes the south, global south where actually these developing countries. I literally also mean that that these are the geographic divisions and these geographic divisions also reflect developmental divisions. So I mean that. But simultaneously also I mean and imply that there is a north in the south and the south in the north. There are underdeveloped communities here, underdeveloped people here. So it is not that north is all north. North has its own south and because this is the process of development through which actually. So when I imply, when I say north and south, I say imply the people who are marginal, people who are actually at that different rhythm, people who are actually located uh, uh, and not actually equally participating uh, the way the growth people are in, entrepreneurs are taking place, taking the uh, 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 mega, major pie of the growth. So I'm, I'm implying that uh, in, in that north and south debate. So keep in mind it is not the geographic division only, it is a class division, it is a community division also and it is a geographic division also. So this, this uh, having said that clarified, I now take the uh, presentation from here so that will be easier for me. It is a very elaborate presentation because I, I was writing down in the uh, slides, I was thinking that I try to give you everything to you. Uh, but it may not be possible and sometimes it appears that the text becomes boring but I will try to explain as much as possible because every word, phrases I try to for the impact I wanted to put for you and that is what the purpose uh, I carry with this. So the presentation has actually three, four parts as you can see. The background, the fast urbanism, and why urbanism I have taken, I explained that one because the cities have become prime uh, uh, focal uh, points for the economic growth. Slow cities, then I come from fast urbanism to slow cities and then I come to the provocations. That's what I to told you, uh, these provocations are there for you and then I sum up and this, this is what I, I follow here. Now I start with the three basic, uh, I mean the classical theorist. And these are none other than Durkheim, uh, all of you know him, I mean uh, from French particularly. Uh, then you have Weber and then you have uh, 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 Marx, these three and uh, three are basically three poles altogether in their own kind of approach. But what they say about the cities, 
Hmm? Because where the capital locates itself in the economic growth process, what they say about that, that Durkheim, I mean, talks about the disintegration of the moral cohesions. That's what he talks, and new morality re being rebuilt in the urban centers. That he talks about. Uh, then you have uh, uh, basically growth of calculative rationality, because all they have uh, a kind of background to start with. Uh, and that is where I have brought here that calculative rationality, where the affection becomes secondary and calculative rationality start prevailing over you to become, uh, uh, to drive your economic growth process. And that's what actually uh, entrepreneurs do often. Growth of calculative rationality. And then you have Marx who sums up the destructive power of the cities. And he says, and which implies largely with the capital also the destructive forces unleashed by development of capitalist production and these are the cities and where you can see. In fact, actually they talk about, they do not give you a different theory of the urban, but they say that urban is very important for the manifestations in which the capitalism really grows. So that actually I bring. But more important among all is the Chicago School sociologist. And this is actually none other than Robert Park and the read the, actually the kind of impact it had on me when I read it. And I carry with me this quotation for every time because this gives you a lot on the cities. What actually he says, just I read for you. He says the city and the urban environment represent man's most consistent and on the whole, his most successful attempt to remake the world he lives in more after his heart's desire. Hmm? Wonderful. Second, he says, but if the city is the world which man created, it is the world in which he is henceforth condemned to live in. Hmm? Thus, indirectly and without any clear sense of the nature of his task, in making the city, man has remade himself. The most powerful sentence. In creating the city, man has, in making the city, man has remade himself. So that is what the transformation has taken place because that is, cities are linked with the capitalism, capitalism linked with the humans, and actually the cities are linked with the humans. So you, you see this, how the man has remade himself, the kind of story comes. Now I come to this, uh, another kind of thing that in the global south, particularly global south, when I'm referring, maybe here you can take geographical, uh, what is happening that an old order, what actually experienced in the, my childhood in India, in North Indian plains of Lucknow, some of you may have visited, uh, and then actually the kind of transformation in last 30 years it has gone from my student days, is massive. And they are bit getting urbanized. And what is happening, they are increased onslaught of the private capital, lots of capital is flowing in India, and also then there is a, a fast cities being created. I will come to that what I mean by fast cities when I say that. The city building process characterized by the fast cities. This is the characterized by the city building process. And mythology, the world city, Saskia Assassins, some of you may be knowing. Mythology, the world city, that you need to have the world city. You have to need to have London, Tokyo, and hmm, New York, not Paris. Paris is not actually a world city for the, Huh. So this is how the world city, Mumbai is not a world city. It can be a secondary pole serving the larger pole. That is what Saskia Sassen and the world level in 1992-93 around which the theory comes in. All the developing countries behind that they want to create world city. Shanghai got Shanghai, Shanghaiization, I mean what we call. And that is where Mumbai was supposed to be made as a Shanghai in India because they wanted to make another pole and the world class city, the people opposed. Hmm? And wrote massive number of papers that don't change Mumbai, let the Mumbai remain what it is because it is a very, very inclusive and inclusive city and not actually the, uh, you can have the poor people as well as rich people together, not actually create a kind of segregations of the rich and the poor because that was very important for all of us. And the opposition led to the kind of consequences that government forgot the plan. That is where there, were, there, there was an NGO, Mumbai First, which wanted to implement uh, Mumbai's development as actually creating Shanghai in around 2003, 2004, sometime. 
So this is how things are taking place. The fast urbanism, what I mean by fast urbanism, I try to explain here. The fast urbanism symbolizes speed. And speed is a literal as well as symbolic. Literal, implied, symbolic. Both are three. Uh, I mean three. Uh, why? Because speed, because the, you, you know that the way the cities are being built? We call Shenzhen speed. Hmm? Chinese speed. You create five, five, one lakh people to the uh, maybe five million people city. Very fast creating. You, know, you create the house for one, uh, I mean, whole city or actually the housing can be created in one year time. So the speed literally means the speed in which actually you create the infrastructure here. Uh, that is speed. Second, the transportations, the speed, lightning speed that you are here. Hmm? Uh, you know the theory that actually you can have the travel in your as per the speed of light, that is what people are doing now, Musk and other, that you can have very faster travel. and uh, So that is also the speed in the transportation. But the speed does not stop here. You can have a speed internet here in the classrooms and we can talk about the speed because it can be viewed what we are discussing here today everywhere. But this, the implication of the other kind of speed is that your life is actually also gets into the speed. So the life itself, for the humans, you are human. You are not a material which actually can move in like electron and proton. You are actually human. And actually, when you do de-alienate or alienate yourself, then actually becomes a problem, atomization, that you become an atom. And that actually creates lots of uh, psychological pressures. And that is where I was calling that all over the world, if you see that development has created so much alienation, where the people put the bumps on themselves and try to, uh, I mean, do all kind of nonsense. So this is a kind of alienation which actually emerges. The prime causes may not be the ideological background. The prime ca causes along the ideological background may be the developmental causes as well. Because the who, what actually alienates people, because the world has existed, ideologies have existed, our religions have existed. But what actually is the new in that? You try to see because all they have existed earlier, but what is new in that which actually has created today's situation? We need to really know how the alienated population becomes, and that becomes a big trouble uh, when you come this up. Whether it is individual, whether it is fast living, and actually fast city building, fast design. So everything has to be. City has to be built, built fast. So building fast means that you need to have architectural plan. Who will give you? Somebody in McKinsey sitting somewhere in New York, maybe tomorrow you will join that, will give you the design. And in India, we will implement it. And Indian people will not like what they are making that they say. Huh? They created pyramid here. Actually, they, they needed some different kind of thing here. So something like that, what, what happened, the cultural context becomes very important. And that is where we try to bring it here. Now, the fast cities also have many other kind of things. They, 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 the fast cities of Global South, a transplant, uh, transplantation in the slow society is what we say. Because the fast growth is a transplant, transplantation of the growth, high growth. For example, in India, even in you say China, uh, this is a transplantation in the uh, a kind of uh, countries where there is a slow societies, in the traditional societies. They are thinking their everyday lives and economic development being paced up what we say that every every day you are pushing them to space up, to speed up, and instantiate it. What say without instantiate it because you become momentary, you move faster. That what becomes. They are being thrown to the different urban and social rhythms. So they are being thrown in the development process, being thrown to different social and urban rhythm and material conditions. So you are thrown to the different material condition. So what actually you are relating? Where actually I was relating? I am not able to relate, but I am in a new context, I get situated, and that becomes a big problem. So they are consumed to the speed through alteration of the sense of time, because for me, you must have seen the modern times. Hmm? Have you seen Charlie Chaplin's modern times? If you know that, that you understand the speed. And ultimately, they run away from the modern society in the end of the picture. Hmm? So this is how the speed actually consumes where time becomes very important for you. And one of the things which actually modernity brought was the linearity of the time. But the society has no linearity because we want to recreate the time again. And that, that time becomes a big problem. Socioeconomic, because the, the, I was telling, the way we related to the people in the past, we are not able to relate. 
it is not that past is always good. I'm not actually trying to really uh, put that when everything was past uh, very good, but we need to really improve upon that. Uh, that socioeconomic alienations, ecological and body, ecological consequences in Glasgow, people are meeting. And you know that for what they're meeting, huh? conference of parties are taking place. So this, you, you, you see that. And then you have body, body under capitalism. Cap I mean, that does not mean that capitalism you don't need. Capitalism, capitalism you need to for creating growth. That does not mean, but over far capitalism, I mean far, like far uh, you become, the more problem it becomes for you. And body, because the, your body is something else and you try to do the laborers. For example, if you, again, I'm going back to the modern times, because it is a good example of how he becomes a machine in himself while doing in the work in the factory. And that where the body does not connect with the soul or the mind. So body, mind dualism emerges and actually your social dualism emerges in that kind of context. And that we see that. It is not that actually we don't, we see every day that in the developing countries. But we, we say that we don't have scholars to write about that. Because if we write about that, they don't get job. And if we don't get job, we don't have our livelihood. That is another trouble. So there is also issues because our research has driven, is being driven by the corporate themselves. So the, they will give you money for, for what they need, the research, not for writing against. So, but we need the critical theories very importantly in order to correct the path. And that is where the, if, if you look at the climate change, that critical theory is emerging. That what we did and where we are reaching. Hmm? So that becomes very important for, our, for all of us. Now, uh, another thing is that these fast cities are actually also locating themselves out of context and exotic planning and the global, in the global south led by fast policies. I will come to that what are the fast policies. These fast policies uh, develop in the global north and then exoticism are actually the monoculturing of the monoculturing. Monoculturing means that world should have only one kind of policy that what is created by this consultancy group or actually some international organization. For example, monetary, in, international monetary fund for long time structural adjustment programs were actually a kind of monoculturing of the world policies. They were not giving money to the nations. Uh, if they were bankrupt, unless you implement the structural, impl uh, and now people coming out against this. And the, uh, I mean, uh, IMF has corrected itself and uh, maybe writing a note that for a long time the policy itself was in a problem. So this is how the monoculturing and planning and city building process is going on today. And that can be source of social and environmental unsustainability that also uh, need to be taken care of. Now, fast urbanism is also linked with many other things. Uh, uh, how actually you market it? Hmm? What we say in the advertisement world that uh, that lo logogenic, logogenic means looking very smart through the words, not in me not actually actual maybe. If you have something wonderful through the concept, is uh, very attractive, and the people in the academics. Uh, also get charmed by that, that when somebody says very good words about something and maybe the inside there may be different kind of implication, not that way that is actually the people's. So the logogenically these cities are called eco cities. What is actually in India eco city, I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean we have grown in the cities and the people are calling eco cities in China eco cities and they have marketed on the eco cities basis uh, that has happened, smart cities. Uh, what, who are the smart people in India? I'm mean, just relating myself. Uh, I am I enough it's smart to live in the smart cities. What way I need to be smarter in that city? And when the only 20% of India's population has some kind of literacy or actually a kind of laptop or actually uh, internet connection, where actually these other people, 80% people will go. And even in 20% what there for that their rhythm is going to be linked with the faster speed what actually is going to come and what be the social and familial consequences are going to be for them that is another kind of question. So these are the questions which actually we try to raise as a critical uh, label and that that what happens. So fast cities in another trouble. There is not only that. Now I come to the economics of the other side of the economics. Fast cities actually create growth. Obviously, it will create growth because they're designed for that. They are actually like uh, I mean engines for the aeroplane and they fly the world capitalism with this, this kind of, uh, uh, say, uh, I mean, this kind of engines. So you have, but they create two kind of circuits which actually be found in Indian research. The two circuits are, one is the accumulation circuit, another is survival circuit. One, you 
and most often you will find that these cities are made on the green field. You mean the green field here I imply that they are made on the uh, I mean the farming communities uh, land and the farming communities are actually those who are actually in the peripheral area they're displaced and they're displaced they are, they are often uh, low illiterate and actually low educated low skilled people and you suddenly displace them make a world class uh, fast city and where these people are going to be then working ultimately these people are not needed in, in fact what happens in the whole process these people there is no housing for them there is no I mean you have I, I will come to the example in India you have Kolkata Rajarhat made by the far right communist I mean they are not far right but they are in somewhere in between the center and left and they are communists they made the city sir Rajarhat which was actually of that kind where the farmers were removed and if you go today you see most of the uh, I mean the glossiest city of India is the Rajarhat where I go I really uh, see that it is a wonderful city in that way and then you have many other uh, uh, in Gujarat they are emerging uh, that kind of city so you you have the uh, circuit where uh, that you have accumulation circuit but why why displacing them what I got I got the land put it different use I got the money so you see the real estate really booming in these developing countries the highest growing sector which actually analyzed is the real estate sector so being consultant in the real estate sector after microfinance became one actually the major if you go and talk to the people who are in the maybe some other uh, in universities uh, in the European countries where they want to go in India and other either in the microfinance and other or in the real estate why because they're paying the faster and they're paying the best because why because they accumulate a lot and uh, if you uh, how how you accumulate because this is the process through which actually you accumulate not it is that you create the wealth ultimately you have not created the wealth you have taken from somebody put in the stock market and actually you done the whole thing it is not the wealth is not created through that because you have not created the material condition for the wealth but you have just put here and there and the whole wealth is created that way so that is where the critically I am looking at it, accumulation circuit and that is how the corporate and other real estate companies are growing a lot in these cities second thing is survival circuit survival circuit is the people like those who are uh, you see as a researcher where they don't find job they do not actually are allowed in the cities to enter sometimes they don't have housing for them even if you see that they, they will be the most of them in, in Mumbai sometimes you go and see uh, lots of people who are there from the farmers who are reduced they will be creating the slums outside and nobody will allow them only they will be sometime domestic work because in India is still the, you have social network very strong so th this is there but many other countries in South Africa and other even if you look at the Rio de Janeiro and other places you have the broken nexus between the slums and the uh, rich areas but in Mumbai at least we have those so but overall the conclusion can be that there is a survival circuit where the people are surplus surplus here does not mean that they are actually use they, they are not needed at all in your city because what they will do there because you don't have houses for them they don't have a skill for that and the city cannot burden itself from them so actually they become the surplus though they were the patients of those lands from where the city has come up and they were some way driving the some kind of resources for themselves so this becomes a kind of surplus population so this survival circuit uh, that also emerges in that those kind of and and that is where we need to talk about them because we have seen the survival circuits emerging now north but this is something reflexive there are actually the people also the philosophers and actually the administrators who are creating the solo cities why the creating solo cities because they also know the faster cities have created like fast food they have created trouble as fast food is actually injurious sometimes in the long term for the health so has been fast cities so they have gone for the slow cities and this uh, slow cities was actually they, they are now telling that uh, 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 they are the only alternative for the sustainable development slow cities and that that means uh, I am coming to the provocation then so need to understand that these rapid changes means to uh, I mean because if you take the fast cities the, the rapid change in the fast cities you also need to understand what they mean for the common man his her livelihood I told about it and his her social position because what happens the social position of these people and what happens to his political art articulation political articulation is such what actually we say that 
the cities which are made led by the corporate, a group, a cluster, a growth, uh, 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 I mean, a kind of uh, group comes and actually creates that city and they become the administrator of that and the common people have no say in that. So you, you have your plutocracy, what the people are calling, where the plutocracy means that you have a group of people where they, they, they try to dominate because they are corporate, they are richer people and then they, wise people, so-called wise people, they actually group together to administer the city and that is the reality that they are doing. And the common men who has been actually living in that area are actually the living in the cities, they become only the subject on which the, I am living in one city in Mumbai like that, where the, the administrator runs it and only I am living in that. Uh, so this is what I say, uh, this kind of cities are there. What happens to the cultures of everyday life? The culture get transformed. And the, what happened to environmental sustainability? All, all of you know that, uh, these things. Now the problem, that then what happens, these are the background, if these are the background which actually you have perceived. How you perceive it? One thing is that you read th through the text and theory. Second, your personal experiences that were actually you have seen around. Third thing is that what are the data available and through this actually you construct that how we ground the argument for then and alternative development. If this is the problem, if this is the problem, I boldly say, if this is the problem, because I, I mean that I, I am ready to accept the, all the criticism which actually the pro-growth economists are going to give me. Still I say that if I accept that and I say, how do we grow, uh, ground the argument for alternative development then? And how we go from far here, eurythmic development. Eurythmic means, again, eurythmic means the climate change, what people they are talking about where the economy, society, and ecology are combined together in a triangle, and you have sustainable development. That is all. And more context-based development rather than more actually the exotic development. Context and exotic development, these are two different things. Then I try to present here, introduce a few provocations, as I said to you. Hmm? Provocation may be right, wrong, and, but try to introduce them towards the alternative process. In city building, how we have alternative process for that, in economic speed, how we can have alternative process for that, how we can have urban social organizations which are different from that, and what is actually everyday city life, uh, what may be the alternative for that. So this is where actually we, we bring it. Now I bit a introduce of the slow cities because that is where I premise my argument because there is a theory they are present there. And they were born before actually I, I, I started actually reading, I mean, uh, uh, came to know that they were born in 1985, somewhere in the slow food movement, 86, and then comes to the 99 where they were actually really formalized. Uh, then you have slow city movement it started in Europe and Europe again, because a very reflexive society, uh, particularly if you look at the French philosophers, I'm very charmed with them, uh, the way they wrote and the way they interpreted the society and took the challenges they were critical, they took front, they were not recognized during their lifetime, but they were actually done and recognized the, even after. So th these are the people who really gave the concept, which actually you can mobilize and use. So you have slow city movement started in Europe, you have slow city, Sita Slow uh, actually were established in Italy in 99, and by mayor of four Italian cities, hmm, uh, and they, they came across and they more than now today, you have more than 235 cities in 30 countries and France has eight cities of this what we call slow cities because they have multiple uh, kind of obligations. You meet almost 75, uh, they have actually the uh, rules which you have to follow that you, you will be licensed to the be a slow city. Otherwise you are in the first city group. Uh, so what the CITAS law has several certification criteria and these uh, criteria basically uh, relate to seven spheres they are environmental policies, you can look at the website where the CITAS law and you can infrastructure policy, quality of urban uh, life policies, then you have agricultural, touristic, artisan policy, you have, uh, you have policies for hospitality, awareness and training, you have social cohesion policy, you have partnership policies. So you have multiple policies and to get certified by CITAS law, a city must have population less than 50,000, but in India 50,000 is a very normal population. Huh, 1.3 billion population and where actually we can increase to somewhere uh, more than that because it's 50,000 we know where fit in that uh, uh, because our kind of scale is different hmm? uh, in China and India. 
So you have this city, uh, I mean, this kind of uh, uh, thing. The slow city movements actually borrows from 1986 uh, movement of the slow food. The slow food movement aims to protect the right to test. Look at, that is why actually the whole thing is derived. Right to test. Hmm? Because you go where you get the authentic cuisine. Hmm? So that way the right to test. Promoting pleasure of eating. The food is one thing which for which all be belong to. If you are in India for a long time as a French, you will start craving for the something which is French. Hmm? Or Indian in, uh, here, or Pakistani here, or Bangladeshi here, or actually maybe from Brazil uh, here. Something you want, something which is very important for you. Because for food, to food we belong. Hmm? Perhaps more than anything else. And that is where they, they say uh, promoting pleasure of eating and promoting traditional agricultural method and techniques. That is again, it is coming, and particularly Indians are understanding this because in the Green Revolution movement, uh, we, we went ahead with that, and now we are realizing we have created a huge havoc with the uh, salt formation in the good fields. And now we are actually uh, reverting back to the uh, organic farming and that is what is happening. So at the heart of the slow food movement is the local community concept of territory that promotes, look at, look at geography connects here. Territory, that geographical distinctiveness. That is where, let New York be where New York is, not to make the Mumbai New York. Hmm? Because that the context they arose may be different. And that where we copy something which is actually good, but maybe that we should be very careful that what we copy from each other. The geographical distinctiveness, raise awareness about danger of the genetically modified produce and their threat to the biodiversity. Because these are the theoretical basis from which actually you do that. And the slow cities, the idea of slow food movement actually constitute the ideological basis for the slow city movement, as I said to you. And this movement aims for basically a set, I mean, creation of progressive network of small towns, slow cities, or a, a sita lenti, uh, what they call, that set out to follow the alternative urban development agenda. So alternative development agenda, that where actually they need to follow. And uh, this provocation, then I come to, also borrows from the novel laureate uh, uh, we have, uh, basically Daniel Kahneman. And this Kahneman gave two things. Uh, and very important, it may be criticized because the brain is not like that, the two, is two system of thinking, our brain does not think in two system, but he simplified that. And what he said, that we have two ways of thinking. Hmm? One is the system one way of thinking, that we think very fast, uh, and that, th that is intuitive. And second is that the slow thinking, that is actually the experience, actually analytical system too. So we, everyone, simplified way, you have two system of thinking. One is the faster, intuitive, second is analytical. The faster means that you have got every day used to that and suddenly you react to that in that way without thinking why you reacted that. Hmm? And the analytical is that you got something, go, think, analyze, mobilize your data and come back that this is true or not true. Nowadays, what is happening in the growth machine process, where actually we have become part of the growth machine and growth coalition, that we don't think that what consequences it is generating what we are doing. And I, I'm not talking about the climate change only. Consequences for the society is more problematic because it is going to be immediately reacting to you. Hmm? And that becomes more problematic. So one has to be very careful and your body and mind what I say. So the fast intuitive and system two. So what he says, that the fast system of thinking, the faster may not be correct. Hmm? And the, there are various uh, riddles about that, the faster. Hmm? And the people say in mathematical terms, huh? I mean, you, you, you may have uh, read that riddle kind of thing, a kind of story that if the combined price of a bat and a ball is uh, Euro 1.10 and the bat cost one dollar more than uh, the ball, what is the price of the ball? And this is not easy to, intuitively you will say one dollar, uh, one euro, but it is not. If you put in the algebraic equation x plus x plus uh, uh, one plus x equal to 1.10 and find the value of 2x, hmm, you will find it is point zero point five. 
algebraic equation. It is not. So intuition, what I say, intuition may not guide you properly and that is the problem. And that means you have to mobilize in where you are faced with the nature, where you are faced with the psychology, you need not be very careless. Hmm? Psychology, where you feel that you are alienated or other thing, it will create madness. So you have to be very careful. Uh, simultaneously, you have to be careful with the uh, uh, climate or actually the ec ecology. So you have to be mobilizing system two. And in fact, if you more mobilize system two, that does not mean system two is not problematic. System two can also be wrong because your data is wrong. If somebody says X person is very problematic and you need not having, um, I mean, you need not have him here or actually kill him or actually, but if your data is such that the data comes as a bias, then you will go for that. So you have to be very careful when you take the data also, because as a researcher, you need to have a proper random sampling, not actually having the biased data also. So that becomes also very problematic uh, uh, issue because the critical thinking also requires questioning yourself at each step also that what you are doing and that becomes, and that what Kahneman's theory uh, background you can uh, also mobilize. Now I come to another uh, question which is the first provocation hmm. in next uh, half an hour I will try to do. I was talking about that the uh, grow slow, the first thing. Now you have development economics, my colleague will say that this fellow has become 15 minutes, 15 minutes so sorry. Uh, he has gone mad. Hmm. He is telling India is having policy for fast growth. He is telling that we go slow. Because why I say, very quickly I will say because of lack of uh, I mean 15 minutes we have, that these are the cities which are actually fast cities being created. Huh? You can read it uh, there. Why I say that grow slow? Because it is very important to grow slow. Why? Just you think about the people who are uneducated. If they want to match with you in the accumulation process or actually growth generation process, they need to also have the education. And if you grow slow, they will have time to adapt and equate with you sometime. But if, because the natural resources, most of the developing countries, the minerals and other, you are absorbing, actually also a huge actually uh, 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 withdrawal of the resources from the uh, uh, mineral resources and water resources, everything. Resources are not unlimited. So ultimately you will devastate them and there will be no, the second generation of these people when educated comes up, they will have nothing. But they, they will look forward to migrate some other countries. That is what actually happening. So you grow slow in order to maintain the intergenerational equity, in order to also not devastate the environment. That two thing, two important thing I would like to say at this point. Uh, and you know that uh, uh, in Global South, uh, uh, th this is happening, destabilizing the economy and other thing. I mean, that, that uh, 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 and depoliticizing, what actually we are having uh, in the uh, Global South, that we are also depoliticizing the growth. Growth is, for me, is a political, because it is for somebody and not for somebody. It is not percolating, trickling down, even while Harshman will talk about. It's not trickling down even properly. So this is a problematic, of the political uh, growth uh, trickles down where actually the governments are strong, institutions are strong, but most of the global south uh, uh, yielding to the corporate push or international push, they are actually also diminishing that. That does not mean all the international and corporate push is wrong. There may be some good one, but we need to uh, find out that what are the good and bad. So consequences of this has been what I was telling, production of private OPAs. Private opias means if you see all the good cities, you have posh areas, are uh, actually the secluded areas, segregated areas. Earlier, the lower section was there, now the upper section is segregating. Hmm? And that is called, you, you have private opias. Breaking down of symbiosis of city and city regions. In the neoclassical growth theory, we say that, sol, sol, uh, solo and so on model, we say that, yeah, everything will trickle down in given time, no? And Bayro and Salai Martin write about the convergence theory. Uh, maybe that is not true for the cities which actually are the embedded in the world system because they are talking to the New York, London, Tokyo rather than Mumbai talking to Maharashtra, hmm? local. They don't talk local, they talk global. And they circulate capital among themselves rather than regions. And that becomes another trouble for, and that is where we say question that neoclassical growth theory now in the new context can be really tested. That what is happening? 
in that process. Uh, farmers lose land and corporate through the imminent domain. That is what actually happening in the new city. Consequences are this, and that what people are calling the primitive accumulation may be going on here also, and creation of surplus population. The consequences of that high speed growth. And that is where we say, uh, also they are creating. In the cities, if you look at bypass development. Bypass development is that, if you look at the most of the global south cities, what they are doing, they, uh, it is literal, it is also the social. Literal means that, the lower section, so, I mean, housing society, they will not disturb nowadays. But they create a bypass over that. So the people who are going and mingling with the lower classes, I mean, they are not mingling now. The city composition, sociality of the city is changing. That is also a, a kind of consequences. And it is assault on the nature that is I, I said to you. So the fast grow, growth is actually is having, I mean, uh, a kind of uh, instability. And the slow growth may have, actually may have more good uh, uh, implication for the society as such. Mm -hmm. Now I'm coming to the provocation city, uh, I mean the uh, second provocation for all of you is the slow policy. Slow policy, what I say that now, you know that uh, most of the, if you see that in the universities, we teach that uh, when you all of you get educated, you go and work with corporate and actually other agencies and you create policies and go and implement in the global south. So you become a kind of vehicle through which actually policies are transferred and very fast. That you make something in IMF, it goes World Bank and goes to the India. And India will accept it. So, and where you will get, I mean the person who is expert, gets the lots of money out of this consultancy. And the people on which it is implemented, they get deprived. So this is also a kind of contradictions. And most of the things, if you look at some of the policies which have emerged, and particularly the smart city policies of India, look at the Bhatia from the BBC has written about it, how the local participation and political participation in some of the cities in Chhattisgarh in the middle of India were actually in the problem where the people were not, they have created a special purpose beacon. There is no special purpose except that you dominate in the political process and do not allow the local voices to be heard in the uh, slow cities. So this is another trouble with the slow, uh, I mean, the policy, the fast policy. And Jamie Peck from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, he writes about a lot about the fast policy and read about, he's a geographer, he writes about the fast policies, read that how the fast policies are created. So I, I leave it here, the fast policies, and quickly come to the third provocation. Uh, third provocation is for you that there need to be a deliberative states, discursive democracy. That, that is actually where the democracy is we are losing. So if you are critical to the government, they will put you some kind of arrest you nowadays uh, and put you in jail. So you cannot even demonstrate and write against the governments. That is also a kind of system emerging. So communities, look at the, in India, farmers. Farmers, because of these fast policies, government corporate policy implementing on the farmers and farmers for one year sitting and dying. I mean, in the many, many of them have died because of the cold and heat and also the motor uh, people have put car on them. So that is also actually a reality. So this is also a kind of reality. So the critical vices in that not coming up and that is where deliberative states need to be there, deliberative policies people call, but I have put here the del uh, deliberative uh, states, because where the state allows discussion, discursive democracy emerges, where you debate for it, that whether good or bad, like a parliament you have, and you debate it, that what need to be there, and what actually in this process need to emerge, that what the grassroots says, that this is the local context, and this is the context in which the development should take place, and obviously there need to be some input into that, but that does not mean out of context should take place. How to operationalize it is another kind of matter, but there should, at the theoretical level, it should be debated from the, and the national policies, what we say, need to be shaped from the local policies. Nowadays, what is there? What the national level thinking goes down, not evolving in a bottom approach, up approach manner, and that is another trouble, that what is actually taking place. Fourth, and the last one I'm coming to that one, is the eurythmic urbanism. And I borrow again, I said the French philosophers here, Le Fabre. And he was in 1960s leading the students' movement here. I think that uh, is a uh, Le Fabre. And he says that eurythmic urban, uh, eurythma analysis, huh? basically you understand rhythm. 
Rhythm means that where you connect society, environment, your body, mind, and uh, uh, activities, how they connect, eurythma analysis. So how the Lee quotidian, what it says, Lee quotidians, everyday life, how you connect it with your, how it, your body is going through every day. If you are in your own area, your own native places, you see that you are feeling comfortable. Many of you are migrant in Paris, still you're feeling sometimes turbulent. Hmm? So your body, how it goes through, and sometimes you are doing something which you don't want to do at all. So you, you, you are that, but psychology, again, connected with the society, ecology, economy. So there should be a rhythm in that. And what he says that all the societies have developed that rhythm. And this rhythm should not be forgotten. And what we are doing, only one imperative, which you have economic growth for achieving that, we are forgetting all these. And we should not be forgetting that. And they are important in the sustainable development overall. So this is what actually he says that we need to be, uh, and they, they can, uh, 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 and he says that go back to the social time. Social time does not mean that you can go. What he says social time means that every day, like your friends, you sit down. Hmm? In India we call adda. Hmm? That you sit down and put uh, your, uh, with the friends and actually discuss. So every day you create that party. In the linear time, clock time, you cannot create that. What he says, the social time is more important for you. Ultimately, the meaning of the life, huh? actually, uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, he used to say, it does not matter to me whether I live for 80 years or 100 years. What is meaningful for me if the 40 years of my life goes in, the, in a thing which actually I see all the good I'm belonging? Hmm? I mean, 100 years you can live what you achieve. So this is actually very important for us. So maybe many ways uh, that social time uh, we need to create in, uh, uh, in our context and that becomes uh, very important. And that is what Lee Faber uh, brings to us. And the act of Ridwa analysis transform everything into the presences. That is another thing. There, he says that there are two things, presence and present. You may be present here, but your presences may not be recorded. Presences means that you are counted as individual and your thoughts and other things are actually. Only it can happen when you have that kind of society where you have that kind of freedom and you have associations. So the present and presence, the body presence is not meaningful for him. The soul and mind's presence is actually more meaningful for him. And that's what he said. It is, it is inherent in the human societies. But what is there that we are transforming is so rapidly that it is actually emerging as a problem and actually a scarce community. Community. So what is happening? This uh, presences are becoming a scarce community. Presents are becoming more actually available to us, and that that actually another trouble. Now I have listed down here few things for all of you. What is the difference between what I am talking? I just read it. Hmm? If you look look at one. Uh, I mean, read it, the fast cities are the fast growth. You say fast, actually everything. You put on the other side and you read that slow cities. That does not mean the binary which I have created. Too slow, too fast can be a problem. If you're too slow, you are not changing, itself is a problem. If you're too fast, itself will. So you have to really basically uh, somewhere come to the, a kind of conclusion where you have the maximum and optimal linkages. And that's what I try to do. Uh, look, look at the fast cities. Corporate center, slow, slow cities, community center. Fast cities, large, and the uh, slow cities, small. Uh, fast cities, homogenized, and the slow cities, idiosy idiosyncratic. There is a simple, single uh, uh, imperative of economic gain. In the fast cities, you have multiple imperative. You can read about it. You have class-led fast cities. You have county-led that cities. You have machine-led, other side, you have community-led here. You have standardized duplication, and you have customized, original, and authentic. Uh, you have uh, uh, planted by uh, nexus of the global and local capital, and you have organically grown, developed, and shaped by local communities. Uh, Corporate-oriented, grassroots-centered. So you have many imperative which actually I listed down, many more can be listed and some of them can be questioned also. You can see that socially, economically and ecologically sustainable, they are unsustainable. They are low, low quality everyday social life, there is high quality everyday social life. There is replicable and transplantable, uh, they are not actually that. Insensitive to the local history, they are very sensitive. Fast and industrial food system you have, they are actually the uh, slow food and local cuisine, they are there. 
their mega structure that side is small and comprehensive dizzying they are not dizzying no uh, that so you have multiple actually you read all these uh, uh, they are actually considered to be a different kind of thing and uh, I mean in, in, in crime theory no uh, this many of the things comes up that when you uh, 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 you, you have spaces and spaces actually emit their kind of symbols and they, they emit their, those kind of actually the a kind of uh, waves where actually uh, uh, we take and receive and fear hmm? uh, all these actually the process are linked with this so this this very important and that is where I come to very quickly to summarize it that one need to really what I want to say one need to really question the development and the development in a context that what actually we are doing and whether we are reflexive enough. And in the fast growth, fast policies, uh, uh, different kind of uh, democracies which actually we are creating, are they really sustainable? Are actually they are impinging upon our life? Uh, we need to really think, uh, reflect, mobilize our data, and perhaps go and think perhaps the childhood, our childhood from where actually we emerge. We will find more of our answers. And the purpose, again I repeat, was to really provoke you here and may not be many of the things which I said may be correct, but trying to say that these are the perhaps need to be critically examined. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, it was really good. And yeah, uh, so we'll make a few comments uh, on the two papers. And yeah, maybe we could move. Um, I think I got well, uh, uh, as the, um, yeah, you just explained it, uh, I will, uh, won't uh, spend so much uh, on it. But um, you touch upon that the fast city uh, narrative, it's more this uh, symbolic dimension. So I decided to write in terms of narrative. And uh, as you said, uh, like the cities uh, have become really important, especially in terms of the economic performance. So, so that speedy becomes like a prominence of democracy and the ecological boundaries. And, and this uh, has affected the relationship between humans and, and the environment. So, um, yeah, and of course it changed like the rhythm um, of the, these two spheres. So like fast urbanization, city making strategies to grow uh, has focused only on economic uh, performance, as you said about the India example, that the asymmetries of the GDP distribution among cities and um, rural areas are uh, really extreme. And the implications are many, and I also point here uh, some that you just <laughs> mentioned about the mar marginalization of local economies and the expanding of high-tech economy while inclu uh, excluding the majority of the population, uh, especially like uh, the spatial segregation between, as I mentioned, urban rural areas. And yeah, of course, the exploitation of natural resources and uh, which has led to the economic crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I brought this um, theory of imperial mode of living advocated by Ulrich Brand that says that uh, it's a critique of saying of our status quo the, uh, regarding the unlimited appropriation of resources, space and cheap labor uh, between uh, uh, global north and global south. And um, the imperial mode of living theory, uh, it relies on the uh, aspects of production and consumption that, had, um, that are deeply uh, rooted on social relations between labor and capital. And they are, um, these relations are um, rooted in everyday practice in terms of how we consume, how we produce. And this, uh, within the city level, has um, bring about many asymmetries in terms of power relations. So it is driven by uh, capitalism accumulation, growth-oriented policies, and mass consumption under fossilist industrial framework. 
So, and uh, again, as a narrative, it says that uh, it's become like a hegemonic narrative that intensifies this fossilist uh, consumption and produ production patterns. So, um, I try to connect this with this fast city narratives that I will explain how these two uh, are intertwined. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, because as I said, that they uh, prioritize uh, growth-oriented strategies over democratic participation, sustainability, and the cultural and local context. As you mentioned, that we try to transplant to to transfer policies from the global north to the global south without taking local and cultural aspects into account. So. Um, and what is important here, uh, as you just raised it during the presentation, the imperative of growth like undermines this city balance rhythm of this uh, economic and social and environmental dimensions. Um, so we have like a fast uh, rhythm that tries to, uh, to push growth all the time without considering you know, population and the social and environmental aspects. And the, I put here like the geopolitical context uh, of what I just said about that the po uh, global so uh, south policies design reflects global north hegemony due to the symmetries of powers. As, as I just said that we try to I come from Brazil, so uh, to do policy designs in terms of what Global North try to follow with this growth-oriented uh, approach. And yeah, and here we have like the limitations of this fast growth uh, orientation because they uh, aggravate the social ecological crisis and also uh, try to, uh, to imply a narrative of how we should, um, yeah, grow or yeah as a site uh, next slide please so um as yeah you can two narrative uh, alternative narratives like sl uh, slow city movements uh, that uh, try to f uh, bring these uh, aspects of local historical context and advocate for slowing down growth through like reducing speeds or taking social and uh, ecological and geographical local context into account uh, reflect like the social claims because it's important to hear of the um, the groups that are affected by these policies um, and especially here I think it's one important point that this bottom-up policy design is important to go through uh, the people on the bottom and then goes to the to the top so, and also the point you just mentioned about the non-linearity, uh, I put perception in terms of, of how we see chronological time and how we actually live socially time. So, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah, and the other concept is the Donald concept that we saw in, uh, in the previous uh, sessions. Uh, we explained very qu quickly, I think everybody knows, but it's just said, uh, it's like an easy language to, to approach how we uh, understand city as a um, sustainable concept. For example, the inner uh, ring that says the social foundation, it means that the basic uh, social resource that everybody needs to live and the environmental ceiling that says that we don't uh, we can't cross this ceiling because otherwise um, we we will we'll see like in this social ecological crisis uh, you can move please <laughs> so um, and when we cross the this, uh, ecological ceiling, we change the rhythm of in the city level of how social and ecological dimensions um, interact. So it changes the balances. So if balance is important, uh, how are we, we are doing now? So I put some um, sentences from the um, Katie uh, Donut concept that we have uh, crossed these uh, planetary boundaries that mi mi millions of people live below the social foundational floor. And yeah, we have put uh, like the ecological ceiling and the ecological resources under um, high pressure. Yeah, and here just um, 
uh, I raised like a question: How to? How do we ensure that we all have the resources to meet our human rights, but within the means of the planet? That it's, yeah, it's a, it's like a concern of this two approaches that say that. For slowing down uh, growth um, movement says that reflecting on urbanization dimensions is important to take the community uh, level uh, dimension into account, the rhythm between the social, economic and, and ecological dimensions and the Donald economic says that we need to reframe the concept of progress because when we, we um, reframe the concept we are looking for the balance between the meet, uh, the needs we need to meet our rights and the um, and the um, planet's life support systems thank you thank you um yeah, i'm just going so yeah thank you also very much for for your talk i found it very interesting and also complementary to the paper so that was really interesting um, I just want to add a little bit um, to the idea um, of contextualizing cities and I really like the way you kicked it off um, by your introduction saying everyone is talking about growth but no one is talking about where growth is happening and uh, yeah I think this um, local like this aspect of location is a, a very interesting one um, and here okay so in my part I want to talk a bit in general about the global contextualization and then especially with respect to finance as well and I just picked um, this quote from Harvey which um, I think is kind of teasing a little bit the idea of um, slow cities in the sense of like it's um, yeah very local connection and the idea of slow uh, of small cities especially um, with very much the the paradigm that is still connected to fast cities so to say so um, I'm not saying that this is something that we should be aiming for and I don't think that is like in fact I from the context <laughs> from which I took this quote uh, and it's also not that something that is Harvey is suggesting but it is a critique and I think this is still a context that I would like to um, discuss more so the question or the uh, what he challenges is um, a regional development process is totally inconsistent with a universal uh, universalism to which which capitalism always strives and this is sort of the the maybe connects with the idea of the fast city movement um so yeah contextualizing um larita already gave her quite nice contextualization with imperial mode of living and which is very much rooted also in our daily practices and our lives that we go about in cities um and i would like to focus more on the institutions that are upholding and producing this sort of lifestyle which obviously um, Ulrich Brandt and uh, Markus Wissen also touch upon but in a very different way um, so yes and um, uh, yeah here again this is a quote from Harvey but this is just to say that um, the the city is just one element and in the in the global scale so to say and this is also very hierarchically stru structured um, and in fact when we think about cities we have to think about um, and especially urban planning and how to what degree slow cities would be possible we have to think I think about um, the context that is happening and whether this is going to be feasible and whether this is going to be feasible or not ha depends very much on the the possibilities to finance this as well and um, so this is a quote I took from Dimsky where he pretty much touches upon this idea of the binary power of finance that you on one hand can change a lot of things um, but on the other hand the way it is currently being used um, it has also very limiting 
um, forces, so to say. And maybe these are the reasons why we are currently in the paradigm of fast cities, so to say. Um, and my question would really be, how can we go out there and how can we move to the slow city within this context? And um, so one idea to illustrate this um, would be the, um, the context, uh, it was also uh, an example of Harvey, which is funny because it's an old one, but I think it is still something that is very like up to date of the automobile industry and how this is shaping the, um, the cities, just because um, this is where most of the funding and investment lies and where so much um, economic and financial powers lies and um, therefore all the highways are being created and our cities are being structured around it and this is not um, yeah, a pedestrian city or cyclist cities even though there's more um, development going in that into that direction but obviously these are actors that are very powerful and that we have to fight if we want to um, develop in a different way and um, so I think what also is interesting about this quote and um, let me just read it quickly um, finance is seen both as a functionalist and potentially dysfunctional um, both a means of resolving one set of um, contradictions financing gaps and the source of another debt repayment gaps so and this is yeah, what I illustrated before, but I think it also nicely outlines um, how it can be a burden for cities and countries in a general sense. And if you contact, con yeah, connect this with the idea of structuralist um, thought, for example, and the way countries are really being limited because of their indebtedness and um, yeah, the global hierarchy of currencies um, connected to the monetary decisions of the IMF um, of the USA. So um, I think it's difficult to take it out out of that context. Um, and then this is just yeah another discussion very much connected to the I example I just gave of the automobile industry, but in general, credit allocation is determined by surplus generation. So yes, um, if people are only investing where they can make profits, how can we make sure the investment is happening, that the, the kind of investment that we want? And um, I, the last point, I don't want to go into much because I don't think we have a lot of time, but I, and I think you explained it also fairly well in your um, presentation already how cities are um, yeah the hotspot for capitalism and also gave the opportunity to to give rise to these big movements of capital flows and and um, this is exactly what you were saying like where where is this happening and this is obviously um, historically connected to the connection of yeah to industrialization but now, lately, also, especially to market liberalization, and um, yeah, and here I just want to get back to to the first quote I know used in the beginning, um, and obviously, yes, um, capitalism strives always to the universal, but the universal is also incorporated in the context, and this is like there is an exchange going on and this is also how maybe it can be challenged so um but the way would be like how how can you go beyond it and these are just um yeah two or in fact three different authors um describing um yeah the different ways of engaging with uh, the local and the global level and i think this last example is really nice in describing how these global processes um, really connect to our local like our very very lives and to the local level of the city so um, yeah for example when workers buy a house at a particular place and time they may do so on the basis of a mortgage arranged and sanctioned by traditions of contract 
supported by government policies and promoted by bourgeois ideology. So also the idea of ideology, you could say, is it only bourgeois? Or if you go back to the idea of um, the imperial mode of living, is this really something that becomes um, part of our everyday lives and is upheld by um, many institutions whatsoever? Um, and yeah, it goes on their monthly payments. Um, to the bank reflect a time and um, morti amortization and an interest rate reflected of the global conditions of accumulation. So again, the idea of um, profit-seeking investment um, mediated by the strength and security of particular institutions within financial system and the strength of the national economy, uh, economy in relation to the world trade. Um, so, yeah, this is just one way to say yes we want this happening and we want this also we need it also on the lo local glo local scale but how um, a l tiny action of an individual like buying a house is connected to these huge flows and this obviously then connects back these huge flows connect back to the way our cities are being shaped and who actually gets the possibility to take out a mortgage and buy a house and where would they do that in which parts of the city in which cities in general and in which parts of the city how is this being gentrified um, and how does it connect with many other forms of um, yeah discrimination and this is an, another topic maybe that you will go later into so thank you thank you Luca thank you professor Shaban um, actually we're, I'm going back a little bit in uh, your uh, the first part of your presentation you talked about the importance also about the physiological um, uh, philosophical and sociological part of acceleration and alienation and then we're we have our own provocation regarding the CETA's Law Initiative. <laughs> um, so the, um, we, um, we want to present um, um, an idea but, uh, of Atmut Hosa, a geog um, not a geographer, a philo <laughs> philosopher and sociologist German, uh, German philosopher. Uh, and he has this idea that uh, Nowadays, we have this acceleration and alienation of this modernity, late moder what we calls, uh, he calls today late modernity, uh, in which speed, which is often related to uh, progress and social progress and economic growth, is actually not time saving. And it turns out that we're most, we are um, time constrained than ever. Uh, so, and then he goes on about three types of accelerations that we have today, technological, uh, about new technologies that uh, are supposed to save time, and also social change, uh, the speed of our relations, the how many experiences we have uh, in one determined period of time, but we don't actually uh, profit from it, like we don't actually um, get the most of it, and individual pace of life, so our really our phys uh, our time perception, what Lorita said, like uh, how do we perceive time? Um, and this has been, as you've already presented, like um, this has impacted our lives in various ways, and one of the ways is the fast cities. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, <laughs> appropriately, uh, we go to the one of the initiatives that confronts this, or, or tries to confront this, which is the City Slow uh, Movement, which is one, it's part of, a, is a spin-up of the uh, Slow Food Movement, as you presented, and the Slow uh, City Movement. Um, here, uh, you've already, <laughs> Professor Chapin already presented uh, the cr uh, some of the criteria, uh, the categories, um, which are, um, like for cities to be eligible to enter the CITES Law movement. Uh, but we can see, like from the list of the cities, 278 <laughs> cities, uh, uh, less than 10% are in the Global South. And you've mentioned um, the case of the, the population, which in scale in India, in China, in countries uh, in the South, it doesn't make sense. So really from the criteria, we can see how it's not um, 
how maybe it's not suitable for the global south. Um, so yeah, since you've already presented, <laughs> and so we saw a little bit of a, an empirical studies to see how does the city's slow movement has been um, influencing this, the cities that that have this territorial certification, which is is that is a territorial certification. It is a label, an international label, um, such as I don't know vegan. Um, it's something that is certified, so it's something that passes through a process, a political process of certification. There's a committee that, um, so we saw like the committee has the committee has also like north um, <laughs> mayors from the global north, and so it's a political process, and it it gives the territorial certificate, which implies that. Some of us, some of them, some of the cities won't get it, some of the cities will. Um, so empirical studies from these uh, cities um, have been uh, pointing out that there are advantages, yes, to be a, a slow city um, label, <laughs> and such as economic growth, local preserving local authenticity, and overall improvement in the quality life of residents. But note overall, <laughs> as Professor Chabon said, we have Global South in the Global North and vice versa. But um, so there are no provisions even in the charter or in the, or in the process of becoming a city's low city. Uh, no provisions regarding welfare of workers, uh, low cost access to this low uh, style, <laughs> lifestyle. Uh, our political participation. So there is, I put, um, uh, this is a Danish, uh, if I recall, and he was uh, really understanding this low city, local governance of small cities, and he, he actually says the city's law would not be applicable to many struggling small cities uh, where there's um, where they're not blessed in terms of physical setting, architecture, history, climate, and cultural traditions. Uh, we can argue about it, but, but really his point is that maybe it's not suitable, maybe we need another movement for the Global South. And for instance, if we think about it, the consequences in the Global South, um, such as gentrification, which is also like fast urbanization, we have that, but does it mean the slow, um, the slow urbanization means no gentrification, uh, rising prices, loss of authenticity, and especially if not all neighborhoods are covered, if we get um, just city centers, and also the the idea of walkability. If we think about walkability, uh, walkability, um, which is one of the logos from the um, CITA's low movement is that we need to uh, walk more, uh, have bikes, but people who don't live in a, in a city center, they have, to, they have to have a car in order to go to their jobs in, this, in the center where the housing prices are, are enormous. So that's something we wanted to provoke <laughs> this, this question. Um, yeah, but first, you gonna. <laughs> yeah, the first question. It's the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's the for the last slide. It's okay. So the first question is: the slow gro growth concept sheds light on many solutions close to the growth perspective. However, is it still adopt a growth-oriented paradigm? So how does low and moderate urbanism differ from the growth and post-growth and, and to what extent does it remain in the growth paradigm? So should we, yes. Yeah, we'll just read all the questions and then pass it to you. Um, yeah, no, just, uh, just uh, rephrasing it. Uh, it's giving, oh no, yeah, yeah, it's mine, yeah. yeah. Given its, <laughs> given its potential to reinforce rather than mitigate inequality and competitiveness within and between cities, 
in the Global South is adhering to terio terio uh, territorial certification such as the slow, the best alternative for the Global South to join the slow city movement, or should we strive for more inclusive and context-based initiatives? Yeah, and my question would be what I already hinted in uh, at the presentation, how can you really resist um, the financial structures that are currently existing today and maybe even use them for your own purpose, not only resist but use them and what, what would be needed for that. And then if I may, I have also another question that we didn't add because we didn't bring that into the presentation. But since you um, talked a lot about the deliberate democracy, I would be interested in as well in terms in the gender aspect of that because um yeah it's a concept that maybe also like uh, is connected to the ancient greek idea of democracy where more discussion is involved and there obviously that that form of democracy which is often praised is very much based on exclusion because you had the slaves and the women that were not counted and that were doing the care work and i think that connects very nicely with your idea of um, rhythm as well and and time and how care work and time is being considered in that model yeah thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much the discussion congratulations definitely <laughs> so many questions and interesting comments, I think. Yeah. So uh, take a bit of time to answer. So the thing is, we have to end up at maximum 4:15, right? So uh, we have like 20, 20, 20 minutes, 20 minutes left now. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, pleasure and the kind of uh, questions you raised. Uh, very relevant. Uh, one by one I take up and then at the end I go to uh, uh, the, the questions which actually you raised. Uh, but let me uh, come to the consumption and production. And if you look at the SDGs, one of the thing is that we have put one SDG as responsible consumption and responsible production. <laughs> responsible and then we are making the far cities. So that is where the where the that is what I say, the logo, uh, logogenic, responsible consumption, responsible production becomes words which are logogenic, not relevant to the sustainability. You understand what I say? That sustainability means that, uh, because, because you are putting the responsible consumption and production, but you do opposite of that. You, what I want to say that you word is very good. Uh, environmental sustainability, environmentalism. Uh, but if you look at the Indian writer, are written about that what we called bourgeois environmentalism. Bourgeois environmentalism is different from the poor class environmentalism. Poor classes survive on environment and there is dependencies. Middle classes and the rich classes, bourgeois, survive on, uh, basically they enjoy the environment. They don't survive, they enjoy the environment. So the survival circuit with the enjoyment, with the environment, different. So consumption and production, when we talk about, need to really look at that, and that you brought very well, that uh, responsible production consumption, they're very good ideas, but implemented in the, uh, when actually reality, uh, nobody follows that. Hmm? That actually is happening. Uh, the first thing which actually say, you said something very important. Institutions, institutions will play a major role. Look at the uh, the two three things that uh, one need to understand that the humans when they get one idea and attracted to other idea, uh, uh, they get trained through that. And institutions are the training institutions when the, our life. Every day is actually that we are getting trained through the institutions, whether it's the family institutions, whether the community institutions, whether the it is a state institutions, whether it is educational institutions. But how much our faculties are reflective faculties? Uh, how much our faculties are actually uh, critical 
and uh, we are allowed to be critical. Uh, we do not shut ourselves voluntarily or involuntarily. So this is very important for us. And that is where I say the institutions need to play a major role. And if a state becomes uh, a reflexive state, a deliberative, what I said, uh, I mean provocative way, uh, like a democracy, a discursive democra democratic state, where it allows citizens to really uh, deliberate and not put one good over another good, but try to see that what is connecting to them and what way they evolve, that becomes very important. And the institutions, uh, if the state starts promoting the uh, uh, sustainability, that becomes very important. And that is where uh, I, I come to that institutions uh, do play a major role. And you thank you for my in many ways highlighting this uh, uh, this one. Uh, then you came to the relevance of slow city uh, to the global south. Uh, I agree with that, that uh, the kind of criteria, but look at these are the ideas. Don't go to the criteria they put it. Look at this, these are the ideas. Idea criteria, 50,000 you have put, may be increased. Because most of the mass society are also in the slow mode. In India, we know the mass societies, but this is slow mode. Not actually the mass society has actually gone to the very speed. The, the way if you we start consuming no 1.3 billion, then there will be lots of climate change issue. Uh, you understand this? Because 1.3 billion people of India, if you start consuming the European standard or American standard, you can imagine the same will happen to the Chinese. So you the mass society does not mean they are very fast mode. Mass society population growth has taken place, another thing is there, but there is still uh, material consumption itself is a low. So per capita energy consumption, per capita material consumption is still low, that does not mean. So you can implement with the enhanced criteria, uh, that can be there. So that, that actually the idea and that I will also connect with the uh, 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 the, your uh, question where the uh, you had that uh, growth uh, paradigms the question which you brought on the growth paradigm you i mean the very interesting question that the idea is still lies with the growth so i because even we talk about the uh, slow and fast what i want to emphasize here the two thing that uh, one that these are not binaries you understand Though we have presented in the binaries, but they are in the continuum. You need growth. You will know need growth because uh, you have to overcome poverty, you have to overcome miseries, you have to health issues, you have to do that. But trouble is that if the disruption happen very fast rather than in a slow mode, slow has adaptive capacities. Hmm? You know so that if you go at 120 speed and you hit a barrier and what will happen to your body in the car? So you can understand this is where the whole thing comes. So this is not actually the binary. It is a kind and a degree difference. I'm sorry, it is a not a kind difference, but it is a degree difference. So it is a kind, uh, so not a kind, but it is degree. So they are located within that, uh, uh, th 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 this continuum, slow and fast. They are not binaries are they are not kind but they are within that continuum and where i am talking about so growth is needed that is um, now question comes for many that what will be the good growth what is the fast growth what is the good growth and slow growth so i i one can say that the, given the example i mean i'm not actually i'm just guessing it i rather than i putting any kind of objective uh, 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 point that any growth which actually stabilizes the society hmm? if you look at david harvey all of you quoted so well i mean i must say uh, i'm big fan of him because the the way he wrote uh, about the economic development and the neoliberalism and other so he says that capitalism get actually annoyed are actually the very uh, 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 troubled when the growth comes down below 3% because then they say they are stagnating, they are eating, they are actually they will die, capitalism is dying and look at the, uh, I mean a brief uh, history of neoliberalism, a small book uh, by David Harvey. So around 3% to 3.54%, uh, this may not be disruptive, uh, particularly in the, I'm just from the experience of India I say, but if we start achieving 8%, 9% Chinese growth rate, we are digging lots of coals. Hmm? 
how we are achieving that export course to australia dig down all the uh, minerals do that one from where the growth will come growth is not can be generated automatically by talking no you have to do do something what you are doing you burn more coal for the generating more thermal power or actually the electric power by the time maybe have if you adopt for 10 years more you may be have more better solar voltaic energy hmm? or actually some other ways you can uh, mobilize the energy but if you are digging only uh, uh, exporting nowadays in india and lots of movement of the tribals happened tribals happened uh, for uh, coal digging in india iron digging in india even that uh, i mean many companies you must have uh, movement against these big companies uh, started because the iron india is iron rich coal rich hmm? and where the actually they are going where the tribals are located and tribals don't have the anywhere no the british started in india this uh, naming the property rights they don't have property rights on the land because it's a commonly held it is my territory they say and if nobody's territory the government's territory and the government territory government say imminent state uh, a, a domain imminent domain goes and says that all of you is nobody's property and it is my property i'm selling it to x company and then x company evicts all the tribals and they have no comp they, because there is a common land it is like fencing where the primitive that is what the people are calling david harvey calling the primitive accumulation and how the development is being done by this and that brings the finance power is a very powerful in fact finance is very powerful and that is where money you know the power of money power i mean what actually you say the money is not only the medium of exchange which economist will say a store of value Simply in economics, we were read, uh, we read that is a store of value. And I mean, a kind of through which actually you can have exchange. It is much more than that. It is an ideology itself. I want money and I want more, more, more of that. And that, that is wh what I get from that. It is also have sociological consequences. I become money oriented, then I become sociolog sociologically disoriented. Huh? So that is also a truth. So you lose friends, you lose everybody because you are making lots of money and this money exercise power on others. If you are a rich man, then you bring and call him here, all of PR is, I mean, aved by that and you stand up whether the person talks anything or not, but it's still PR actually because money he has. So the money gives political power, other power. So this money power is actually rooted in the finance. So the financial institutions become more powerful and that is why IMF is more powerful than you know i mean though all the uh, i mean a kind of multilateral agencies but many agencies human right nobody likes hmm? they are actually unicef they were even uh, called a trouble maker by usa itself hmm? unicef for a long time in 1960s harshman was working and harshman you know that the person who uh, economists read about his lifetime i was just re writing something about the great mind in economics uh, economics i read about his history really it's a i mean uh, wonderful actually career and the very troubled life he has so just and he worked how actually he was because he was slightly socialist in the nature socialist not socialist he was uh, one, one can say the concern also for the human being in the economic growth that and just i will tell you the story with the finance i was uh, uh, in 2010 11 i was with the london school of economics visiting there so I used to meet students and at that time India was obviously charming rising uh, power nowadays we are slow growth we are gone uh, <laughs> because of many reasons uh, so I met a student who was from uh, perhaps economics finance somewhere and he came to me that he was searching that uh, Shaban I should come to your country I said please come you are welcome he said, no, that I'm doing my finance course and I want to join finance and microfinance. I said, please don't come to my country. <laughs> huh? Please don't, don't do come to my country then. Because he said, why? I said, you know that you will be part of some financial institutions here and they will give you big fat salaries. And you come for salary, not for anything else. You don't love Indians that way because you're coming for salaries. Huh? So you will have fat salaries and from where the money will come. 
the microfinance institutions will mint money from the poor in India. They give money and the real rate of return in microfinance may be around 24 to 36 percent per, hmm, per year and sometimes uh, it is like money lenders. So what is happening? Why there you are dealing with the poor making lots of money, how it is possible? You just think about it. So he was surprised. I said, uh, otherwise you are welcome, but don't ask because I just stand opposed to that. I know that responsible consumption, production and development is needed, but not actually the exploiting the poor. There is some ethics of development, like ethics of actually the corporate sectors. No, we talk about company ethics and ethics of uh, corporate ethics and actually the, all the poor. So there is ethics of development and particularly the microfinance companies are dealing with the poor, making lots of money and that is not good for you. Huh? And I don't know whether he understood that what I wanted to say or actually it was poor man is explaining him that. So this, this, this what I say. So this is how the power of finance lies in the whole process. And the finance that is where I said both because it deals with the money and money if you want to read about the power of money. I, I mean nowadays it become very bad but read capital where he talks about the money hmm? uh, uh, Marx. Uh, uh, why? I, because the, he, look at, he, it is not that Marx is a somebody who, but he writes a critical uh, things about the capital and it helps us to understand things. It is not that actually is a very charming idea, but it, it helps you to uh, understand the, the things which can come along with the, uh, that kind of strong growth and uh, 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 that capital uh, uh, I mean circulation. So that is very important for us. And that and the last thing which actually I would like to say that what you said about gender, no doubt about it. That is the women uh, remain one of the most half of the uh, particularly global south which I have seen uh, is most exploited section of the population. And maybe in certain societies, certain groups, the situation is better. Uh, but this need to be promoted and no doubt about it. And one thing is said in India, if you want to manage certain thing in better way, give in the hand of women. Hmm? In, uh, in Indian families, uh, my mother is still uh, manages uh, lots of things which actually I do. Huh? Maybe that here the families are disintegrated, but we still have continuity, parents are very important. Then yes, children. So we have three, four generations together, learning from each other and continuing. Uh, here the learning process is more through the institutions, uh, which are actually non-familial. For us, uh, that may be familial and continuity that is there. And what, what actually it brings the message that the women can manage much more and if their participation can be ensured, uh, obviously much more uh, uh, problems which actually we face uh, can be then better registered and uh, that and it is actually a kind of also a question not only that uh, for the sustainable development and growth but it is a human right also issue and in many countries what I say that this situation remains grim for the women and in various ways they are sometimes uh, excluded from the uh, public places, sometimes put under somewhere else. So this is, this is what actually going on and that means that uh, participation and some of the developed countries, they offer that actually kind of thing where 40% uh, we were talking uh, in certain kind of uh, institutions and participation is must. So those, those participation can be ensured. Uh, so this, this is what I want to uh, uh, say, uh, but any other open question which actually all of you have on this, I'll welcome. We are